Welcome to another edition of the Law and Gospel Devotional. My name is Eric Sorensen, and each week we take some time to look at God's two words from all of the scriptures, both his word of law that tells us what we ought to do and his word of gospel, which tells us what God has done in the person and work of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Good to be here with you again as I am back at home, back in my home turf, making this video after it feels like many, many many weeks of travel all very good travel all very good things but nevertheless uh gone a lot it's good to be uh good to lay my head down on my own pillow in my own bed so uh let's go ahead and dive into uh, what we have for today uh, today we're going to be looking at the uh, old testament lectionary text and that old testament lectionary text is found in deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 10 through 20, and uh, if there's any way that I uh, am prone to summing up what Deuteronomy 30 is all about, and really all of the book of Deuteronomy to some extent, is really the phrase, just do it, which Sheila LaBeouf in his video, if you haven't seen it, you can look it up on YouTube. There's a video, just type in, just do it, Sheila LaBeouf. You're going to see that basically he just says that over and over and over again, and that's basically what much of the law does in Deuteronomy chapter 30. As I said, a little context about it, Deuteronomy is essentially uh, really a repetition of the law given to the people as they prepare to enter the promised land. So Moses and Joshua, the leadership of Israel, want to make sure, and of course God wants to make sure as he guides Moses and Joshua, that his people know what is expected of them, what is expected of them as covenant keepers because remember the nation of israel when asked if they would do all the words of this law said heartily yes we will yes we can we'll do it and so okay you say you'll do it well here's what is expected of you and in case you forgot here's deuteronomy repeating it and as we come to chapter 30 things are really kind of beginning to be summarized. Uh, the, the other 29 chapters really uh, have, have gone over the law, and now we come to the summary chapter uh, as we get closer to the end of the book. And, uh, and what I want to say first and foremost is we're dealing with what could be coined, uh, what could be termed a simple impossibility. Deuteronomy 30 verse 11 says, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. So right out of the gate, after giving all these commands throughout all of the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord says through Moses, this command that I give you is not too hard for you. Now, if you have watched these videos before or you're familiar with the concepts of law and gospel, then you're probably tempted to say with uh, Ron Burgundy, say what? What in the world are you actually talking about when you say that the law is not too hard for us? Well, that's why it's important to read verses in their context, because verse 12 goes on to say, It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. In other words, the point, the point of this passage, uh, at least in verses 11 through 14, is to tell us that God has revealed himself through his word. He's revealed his word to us. We have the scriptures. And so what that ultimately means is that the children of Israel and by extension us have no excuse. So even as we get sort of some context there where God is saying the word is not far, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not far away, it's right in front of you. Nevertheless, the reason that's there is to give us the inclination or give us the indication that in fact we have no excuse. We know what we should do, we just don't want to do it. This is Romans 7 stuff. And by the way, it's not an accident that Paul references that last passage in Romans chapter 10. Uh, Paul, indeed, it looks like he has been reading through Deuteronomy uh, at various uh, sections in the book of Romans. But so the law is laid out for us. We know what we should do. We don't have the excuse of it being like, well, I just can't get to it. No, 
we have it. And what this reminds us of is a phrase that Martin Luther used. And, um, you know, he referred to our wills, the human will, as bound. Uh, of course, his famous uh, diatribe or his famous book uh, responding to uh, the humanist Erasmus has been uh, called the bondage of the will or the uh, captivity of the will. And the idea behind it is that even though, of course, human beings know what we ought to do, because our wills are bound to sin, we choose not to do it. That is the problem. So in this passage, we see right out of the gate, the bondage of the will is strong. And indeed, the symbol is strong. Now, why do I say the symbol? I mean, simultaneously, saint and sinner kind of thing. You know, this, this is a key, key understanding for us. Well, the reason I say that is because, of course, the nation of Israel had been saved. They had been delivered through what Paul calls a baptism in the Red Sea. They had been saved, delivered from their bondage in captivity. And yet, what do we see all throughout Israel's history in the Torah? They keep on going back to the same old habits. They keep on going back to the same complaints. They keep on sinning, even though they have been saved. And so we can relate. We understand what it is like to be the people of God hearing the law. We know what we should do. We don't do it. And this causes a real problem when we consider what God goes on to say, because it is all conditional statements for basically the rest of this chapter. It really is an if-then kind of thing that's presented to us. So right out of the gate, verse 15, he says, See, I have set before you today life and good death and evil. If you obey, now very important, the word for obey here, and as a matter of fact, in Hebrew, is not the word obey like we have in English, but in fact, it's the word hear. It's, it's here. If you hear the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. You hear that? If, then. If you do these things, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. We understand this. Everything about our world is conditional. Everything about our world is if, then. Scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. That is typical for us. That is the way that the this particular covenant the covenant, uh, the, the Sinai covenant, actually works that you must do in order to get. And yet, I do want to point out, and this is why I, I, I emphasize that obey actually means here. I do want to point out that it begins with hearing the word of God. The problem for sinners is that we don't have ears to hear that we stop up our ears with a thousand other lesser things instead of the word of God. And it is due to our lack of hearing the word of God that leads us then not to love the Lord our God and not to walk in his ways and his statutes and his rules. It is not hearing the word of God that is the problem. It always begins with hearing. After all, what does Paul say again in Romans chapter 10, verse 17? Faith comes by what? hearing, and that hearing is the word of Christ. Continuing on, just as you will get life if you do these things, he also promises death if they do not. Verse 17, but if your heart turns away and you will not hear, again, same word. It's interesting that the ESV chooses to translate the word hear in verse 17, hear, and yet in verse 16 it does not, but I digress, you could interchange it. If your heart turns away and you will not hear, you stop up your ears, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. Very, very, very important. My good buddy Dan Price, who I record 30 minutes in the New Testament with each week, has said that he believes, and I'm right with him, that the ultimate sin that undergirds all the other sins is, in fact, idolatry. The, the reality is there's a whole lot of sinners in the Old Testament and God seems to be forgiving of them over and over and over again. So a man like David can be called a man after God's own heart, even though he has sinned greatly in different ways with Bathsheba, with her husband Uriah, etc., etc. And yet David is still called a man after God's own heart 
Well, because it seems that he doesn't commit this, he doesn't give in to worshiping false gods. You'll see this mentioned all the time in the history of Israel in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Uh, a king's life will be summed up by whether they allowed false gods to be worshipped. That's often sort of the indicator as to whether they were a good king or a bad king. The point is not that other sins don't matter, but the foundational sin always is idolatry. Always. When we choose to do something that's contrary to God's will, that we know is contrary to God's will, what we are actually saying is that we indeed do not trust him above all things, and that is what it means to worship him. So he goes on to say in verse 18, but our, he says, if you're drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you were going over the Jordan to enter and possess. Indeed, uh, it does seem that it doesn't take long before the nation of Israel goes into the land, and yet they, at least some of them, do perish because of their sin against God. Because what are they prone to doing all the time? Worshiping false gods, giving into idolatry. So, what are we to do with all this? Well, uh, it doesn't get any better because in verse 19 it says, uh, in case you were wondering, uh, you're being watched. Uh, it says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. Now, this is always done at the end of a treaty or end of a covenant that you would call witnesses to make sure that it was validated. Uh, God cannot call any witnesses equal to himself here, and so he calls heaven and earth, being that he is the only God, he calls heaven and earth because there are no other gods, to be his witnesses against the people that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So this is the way the law works. The law is hounding us. It's watching us. It's testifying against us. Yes, it just by simply telling us what we should do, uh, you would think that, that uh, you know, we get our marching orders and that would be fine. But no, the law, by doing that, actually hounds us, actually tells us that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And so at the very end of this, God basically calls the Israelites again to choose life. And really, it's so simple. All of this is so simple to understand. The law is not hard to understand. You shall not murder. We all go, uh-huh, I get that. That makes sense. I don't want to murder. Yes. But then we find ourselves unjustifiably angry in our hearts toward our brother, and we re recognize that we're guilty. Uh, the law says you shall not commit adultery, and we hear Jesus say that that means you shall not lust, and we recognize that we're guilty. And we can go on and on with all of the commandments that way. It's simple to understand. I mean, God says it very clearly. Therefore, choose life. Like, if you, if you have to choose between life and death, go for the life. I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of the life. I'm a fan of the life. It makes sense that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying. Again, the word is hearing his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days. Notice again, it is hearing that is the foundation. The word of God must be preached. And really what this is saying here is uh, essentially we love God because he first loved us. That was true for Israel. God delivered them not because of anything they did, not because of anything good that they, they earned, but because God is faithful and good to them. And yet what's the problem? Even though it's so simple, again, we are addicted to sin. We find ourselves doing it over and over and over again, even though we know it leads to death. So you're saying to yourself, Eric, um, you know, you've, you've given a whole lot of law. Well, I'm just reading the passage, and yes, it is a whole lot of law. There's a whole lot of law for the nation of Israel to live under, and frankly, it's a whole lot of law for us to hear. And so where is the gospel in this? Well, I think there's a, an allusion to it in the last part of verse 20. He says here, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. Now, why is that significant? Because what is being highlighted here is not merely a recitation that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the fathers of Israel. No, what's being highlighted here is the covenant that he made with them to give them the promised land. And do you know what is different about that covenant as opposed to the covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai? It is that it is a unilateral, unconditional covenant. That's true for Abram. It's true for Isaac. It's true for Jacob. 
Jacob certainly had nothing that would have suggested that he earned God's promise to fill the land with his offspring. And yet God promises it to him. Abraham had made plenty of mistakes, and yet God promises him. Promises him on his own faithfulness, on God's faithfulness alone, that he will, he will make good on that promise no matter what that he will bring their offspring into the promised land. And it is in the context of that promise that God also says that from Abram's offspring, one day there will be someone that will be a savior. So yes, you have to read behind the lines a little bit, but now we've got a hint of gospel. We've got a hint of good news that even though God does give these sort of temporal uh, punishments or disciplinary measures to the nation of Israel throughout all of its history and does promise that they will face grave consequences for their sin, true for all of life, that yes, you will face consequences for your sin. Nevertheless, God is still faithful to bring his people into the promised land and he will do so for you and I in the true and better promised land. There's even better news than just this hint at the end of verse 20. The reality is, if you were to read the surrounding context of this verse in verses 1 through 10, and then right after in verse uh, in chapter 31, uh, you are going to see that it is filled with, indeed, promises. In 31 through 10, there's a promise of being turned back to God in spite of their future sins. Yes, there's a little word of prophecy there where basically God says, even when you fall short of what I'm commanding you to do, I am going to turn you back to me. I'm going to repent you. And how does he do that? He does that through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's not an accident. I don't think that right after this in Deuteronomy 31, a promise is given that a Yeshua, a Joshua, will lead them into the promised land, just as Jesus has done everything necessary to lead us into the promised land. And it is from that passage that we hear the very famous and familiar words that the nation of Israel got to hold on to as they entered the promised land and that we get to hold on to as members of the body of Jesus Christ who has lived, suffered, bled, died for the forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future, and has risen from the dead to give us the future hope of that resurrection in the promised land. It is these words that are said to the nation of Israel and these words that we can hold on to as we go. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. He's talking about the enemies of Israel. Do not be in fear, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Yes, indeed, God will finish what he started in you. Even though you struggle with disobedience, even though you struggle with with falling short of his law each and every single day, the words stand strong. He will not leave you or forsake you. Or as the book of Hebrews says, he will never leave you or forsake you. And so that is your law and gospel devotional for today. I hope that's been an encouragement to you. I hope that you do, in fact, uh, know that you are strong and courageous in the Lord because he is with you and will never leave you nor forsake you. God's richest blessings to you.